Hello everyone and welcome to another audiobook. Today we are going to be um we're gonna be reading Dance With Me. That's what is the title this one's called. Uh Dance With Me. So I read Step Closer um two days ago. Really enjoyed it. Uh and I just really kind of want to bang this out in one day again. Uh so hopefully you enjoy. Uh I have no idea what this is going to be about. I heard there's weird glasses, but we're going to see. We're going to see. Uh, let me just pull my mic back. <laughs> okay, that may have made a loud sound, but... <laughs> I'm sorry. Okay. Hopefully we should be good. The stars looked like tiny pinpricks of light shining through a sheet of black velvet. Casey lay on her back on a low stone wall staring up at the sky, feeling wonder at being even a small part of such a beautiful universe. She remembered a nursery rhyme from when she was little. There had been a colouring sheet in kindergarten, with the nursery rhyme's words and a picture of smiling stars. Twinkle, twinkle, little star, she thought. How I wonder what I am. Casey! Jack's voice startled her out of trance. Look over there! Casey sat up and looked at the brightly lit kiddie restaurant across the street, Circus Baby's Pizza World. A woman and two young children were standing outside its red door. The woman was fumbling with her purse. Let's go, Jack whispered. Casey stood up and casually crossed the street with Jack, ducking into the alley next to Circus Baby's, close enough that she could hear the little girl chattering to her mother. I think Circus Baby is pretty, the little brown-haired girl said. She was wearing a t-shirt decorated with Circus Baby's Pizza World creepy looking mascots. She is pretty, the mother said, looking a little dazed, probably because she had spent too much time surrounded by the bright lights and loud na noises of the kiddie pizza emporium. Can I wear pigtails like Circus Baby? the little girl asked, pulling two handfuls of her hair up into bunches. She couldn't be much older than three, Casey thought, four at the oldest. Sure you can, the mother said. Hold your brother's hand while I find my car keys. Her hands were all sticky from candy, the boy complained. He was early elementary school age, maybe seven. Mummy, I'm so sleepy, the little girl asked. The little girl said. Can you carry my goodie bag? She held up a little plastic bag with the name of the restaurant printed on it. <laughs> the mother had found her keys. Sure, she said. I'll just put it here in my purse. Can you carry me? I'm too sleepy to walk. The mother smiled. Okay, come here, big girl. Her purse dangled from her left forearm while she leaned over to pick up her daughter. Now, ja Jack barked into Casey's ear. Casey pulled the ski mask over her face and dashed out from her hiding place in the alley. She ran past the mother and grabbed her purse with a swift, sure motion. She kept running as the woman yelled, Hey! and the little girl screamed. As Casey ran, she heard the little boy say, I'll catch the bad guy, mummy. No, the mother said firmly. You stay here. Uh, by the way, before we continue, I just want to say, I have never read this story, so all of this is my reaction to it. Uh, and I didn't realise Circus Baby's Pizza was going to be here. This is pretty cool. If they said anything else, Casey didn't stick around to hear it. Casey knew she was fast and she knew there was no way the mother could catch her on foot, not with two little kids on their hands. After Casey had put some distance between herself and the crime scene, she took off the ski mask and stuck it in her jacket pocket. She slowed to her walk and carried the purse casually, as if it belonged to her, and now, she, put, she supposed, it did. She met the guys back at home, or at what passed for home. Casey and Jack and AJ stayed in an abandoned warehouse. There was no electricity. They had to do make do with flashlights and camping lanterns. But there was a good roof, and the building was well insulated, which made it warmer than being outside. They slept in sleeping bags and heated food on two little burner on a two little on a little two burner cook stove, the kind people use on camping trips. Actually, living in the warehouse was a kind of indoor camping. That was one way to see it, Casey thought. She sat on one of the wooden crate crates that they used as chairs, holding the stolen purse in her lap. How much do we get? Jack asked. 
uh, leaning over her shoulder. He was sharp-nosed and twitchy, like a rat. I like how you say we, even though it was me who took all the risks, Casey said, unzipping the purse. That's the code of the thieves, Den, AJ said, sitting on the crate next to her. He was big and bulky, the muscle of the group. We share everything. Yeah, Jack said. It's like how coaches say there's no I in team, except it's there's no I in thief. Yeah, but there actually is an I in thief, Casey said, laughing. She pushed her long braids out of her face and peeked inside the purse. The first thing she pulled out was the little girl's goodie bag. No wonder the kid had screamed. She didn't want to lose all the can candy and plastic junk she had won at the pizza place. Casey stuffed the goodie bag in her jacket pocket and then found what they were all waiting for, the woman's wallet. How much? Jack said. He was trembling with anticipation. Hold your horses, Casey said, unfolding the wallet and taking out all the bills. She counted. It looks like... $87. It wasn't great, but it wasn't terrible. People hardly ever carried cash anymore. What about cards? AJ asked. I'm looking. She glanced briefly at the woman's driver license, then looked away. She always felt bad when she thought of the victim as having a face and a name, of them having to wait in line at the DMV for a new license. She pulled out the plastic cards. One gas credit card, one general credit card. The gas card was of limited use since they didn't have a car. Still, they could use it in a gas station food marts, and they could definitely get some use out of the credit card before they had to ditch it. Katie badly needed new, some new socks and some new pair of boots. The ones she was wearing were battered and held together with duct tape, so her feet hurt all the time. We'll try out the cards tomorrow, Jack said. In the meantime, $87 split three ways is... He made a big show of doing the math, writing in the air like he was solving a problem on the board at the wall. $29 each. I'll take 20 of that now, Miss Casey. I'm going to go out and see how much a young person can party on 20 bucks. You coming with me? I will, AJ said. Give me a 22, Casey. He held out his hand. I think I'll stay here, Casey said. She wasn't a partier like Jack and AJ. Her mother had partied a lot, and Casey had grown up knowing her mum's tendency to blow through all her money in one carefree night meant that they had to live with the consequences until her next paycheck. Why? Jack asked. That's no fun. I'm tired. Casey put the wallet back into the stolen purse. I was the one who did all the running, remember? After the guys had gone out, Casey lay on top of her sleeping bag and dug through the plastic sack from Circus Baby's Pizza World. She pulled out a pair of cardboard glasses with flimsy plastic lenses. The cardboard was decorated with a picture of some kind of weird robot ballerina. Ballora. <laughs> Casey put the glasses on briefly, but they made her feel strangely dizzy. And if there was something she was supposed to be seeing, it was too dark to see it. Sorry. She put them in her jacket pocket for later. Everything else in the bag was candy. Casey and her fellow thieves ate to survive. They had cheap, fast food burgers when they had little money. Canned beef stew or ravioli shoplift from convenience stores when they were broke. It had been a long time since Casey had eaten a piece of candy. She found a red lollipop, unwrapped it, and popped it into her mouth, enjoying the sweet artificial cherry flavour and feeling like a kid again. A little kid. She had robbed a little kid. A saying, sorry, a saying came into Casey's head like taking candy from a baby. That's literally what she had done today. She wasn't proud of it, but at the same time the kid's mum had nice shoes and a nice purse and a car. If she had enough money to take her kids out for pizza and arcade games, she could afford to buy her kids more candy. Why had Casey turned out the way she had, not like the woman she robbed? Casey hadn't planned to be a thief who slept in a warehouse. She doubted those were anybody's career goals. Casey's mum hadn't been crazy about being a mum. She worked nights and slept days and often when and sorry, she worked nights and slept days and often when Casey came home from school, her mum looked at her with a mixture of surprise and annoyance as if she were thinking, "Oh, I forgot. I have a kid, don't I?" Dinner was usually a bowl of cereal or a sandwich before her mum went out to the to work at the club. While her mum was gone, Casey did her homework, took a shower, and watched TV until bedtime. She had instructions to go to the apartment of the old lady next door if there was ever an emergency, but there never was. 
Casey was good at taking care of herself. When Casey was a teenager, her mum got a new boyfriend who seemed like he was going to stick around longer than her past string of boyfriends. He had a steady job and could help her mum out with money. The only drawback was he didn't want a teenager around freeloading, as he called it. He said he had moved out of his parents' house and gotten a job by the time he was Casey's age, and that was why he was so successful. When he asked her mum to choose between him and Casey, he, she didn't think twice about the choice. Casey was out on the street before her 17th birthday. Casey's teachers had begged her not to drop out of high school. Her grades were solid, and she was an athlete, so there was a possibility of college scholarships, they said. But she couldn't stay in school and still earn enough money to survive. She dropped out and drifted from one dead-end job to another, working long hours but never making enough to cover rent and groceries. Sometimes she stayed in sad little rooms she rented by the week. Other times she camped out on friends' couches until their hospitality ran out. The first time she stole was at Famous Fried Chicken, the fast food restaurant where she was working. It was a terrible job. She stood sweating over the deep fryer for hours, and every night she went home feeling like she had been dipped in a vat of grease. One day, when she was sweeping the floor of the dining area, she noticed that some guy had gone to the restroom and left his jacket hanging on the back of his seat. The corner of a $20 bill was peeking out of the pocket. It was too tempting. Sweeping the floor right next to the table, Casey pinched the bill and hid it in her sleeve. It was shockingly easy and somehow exhilarating. She knew the guy would never suspect thief. He'd just think that he should be more careful. Making minimum wage, standing over the hot fryers. It would have taken Casey more than two hours to earn the money that it took her less than a minute to steal. There was a thrill in that, to know you had gotten away with something, beaten the system. Soon she was stealing instead of working, snatching purses, picking pockets, shoplifting food and other necessities. One day she was at a street festival, lifting wallets and loose bills from people's pockets, when two men approached her. At first she was scared they might be cops, but they didn't look like cops. One was a scrawny, fidgety white guy with lots of tattoos, the other was a broad-shouldered black guy with the appearance of a former high school football player. We've been watching you, and you're good, the thin, nervous-seeming one said. Have you ever thought about working with a team instead of flying solo? We look out for each other, the big guy said, and we split our take. More people working, more people money. More, more, pe <laughs> more people money. More people working, more money. She fell in with Jack and AJ because they had been on the streets longer than she had and were willing to share their knowledge of how to survive. Sure, they were more reckless than she was and blew through the money they stole, but there was safety in numbers. Even though the guys got her on her, got on her nerves sometimes, she would rather have their own their companionship than try to make it on her own. Casey finished the red lollipop and snuggled into her sleeping bag. She fell asleep with a sweet taste still on her tongue. Interesting. I like where the story is going. She awoke to sunlight steaming through the warehouse's skylights. Jack and AJ were both still snoozing away in their sleeping bags. Casey had no idea what time they had come in last night. She slithered out of her sleeping bag and decided she'd use two dollars from yesterday's take to buy a cheap breakfast at the Burger Barn. A sausage biscuit and a small coffee with free refills could last her all day if it had to. Casey grabbed her backpack and walked into the bright morning sun. The Burger Barn was just half a block from Circus Baby's Pizza World, the site of yesterday's heist. Casey chuckled thinking of it as something as dramatic as a heist, since it involved stealing a bag of candy from a child. She went inside the burger barn, placed her order, then sat down at an orange vinyl booth beneath a mural of cartoonish barnyard animals. She added cream and sugar to her coffee, unwrapped her biscuit, and took her time with breakfast. As she nibbled her, br her biscuit and sipped her coffee, she watched the other customers. Most of them were grabbing orders to go, as they rushed off to their jobs at offices or stores or construction sites. They all looked stressed out and in a hurry. That was one good thing about Casey's life. She could take her time. The only time she had to hurry was when she was running off with somebody's worse or po worse or pollet. Oh my gosh, what is going on with my voice today? Purse or wallet.
Buying breakfast at the Burger Barn gave her the right to use the ladies' room without being kicked out. This is a right she treasured. After she finished her meal, she made her way to the restroom to do her, her grooming for the day. She locked herself in a stool and took a sort of sponge bath with baby wipes, then changed her socks, underwear and shirt. After she was done in the stool, she went to the sink and washed her face and brushed her teeth. A woman dressed in the button-down shirt and khakis of an office job gave Casey a dirty look, but Casey ignored her. She had as much right to be there as anyone else. Casey filled her water bottle and put it back in her backpack. She was ready for her day. Out in the sunshine, her belly full of food and coffee, Casey felt good. She thought she might take a walk in the park before she went back to the warehouse to see what the boys were up to. As she walked, she shoved her hands in her jacket pockets and felt the cardboard glasses from the little girl's goodie bag. She smiled to herself and took them out. <clears throat> She hadn't noticed that a tiny slip of rolled up paper was taped to the glasses left earpiece. She peeled the tape off carefully, unrolled the slip of paper and read, Put on the glasses and Ballora will dance for you. Oh no. <laughs> okay. Casey put on the glasses and felt the same dizziness as the night before. She looked down the sidewalk towards Circus Baby's Pizza World. There, in the distance, she saw the image of a ballerina, her hands above her head, standing on tiptoe and spinning. It wasn't a very sharp image, blue and a little fuzzy, a hologram. That was what these kinds of pictures were called, she suddenly remembered. But even if distant and blurry, there was something fascinating about the strange ballerina doll twirling, a pirouette. That was the word for what kind of for that kind of twirling. When she was little, Katie had wanted to be a ballerina, just like lots of other girls. But there had been no money, and her mother had said that even if there had been money, she wouldn't waste it on something as useless as dance classes. Casey stood on the sidewalk and watched the image as though hy hypnotised. It was beautiful, and there was so little beauty in Casey's day-to-day -day life. Casey felt overcome with sadness and longing and other feeling too. Regret? Was she regretting the way she lived? A life should have beauty in it, shouldn't it? Life should be about more than just survival. After a while, Casey started to feel dizzy as if she were the one doing the pirouetting herself. Afraid she might be sick, she took off the glasses and leaned against the side of the building to get her bearings. She looked down at the pair of glasses in her hand. Really, the ballerina was a pretty impressive visual effect for what looked like such a cheap toy. No wonder the little girl was upset when Casey snatched her goodie bag. To a little kid, these glasses would seem downright magical. Casey put the glasses in her pocket. She decided to skip the park and go back to the warehouse. She had to show the guys this crazy toy. Jack and AJ were just walking up. Oh, uh, sorry. Oh my gosh. Jack and AJ were just waking up when she got back. What time did you guys get in last night? Casey asked, sitting down on a crate. Dunno. Two, three. Jack yawned. He propped up on one elbow in his sleeping bag. It doesn't matter. I don't have to punch anybody's time card. AJ unzipped his sleeping bag and sat up cross-legged on the floor. Hey, we were just saying we might take that gas card you pinched up to the gas and go and see if we can use it to get some groceries. Sure, Casey said. It'd be good to have some food in the house, but first I want to show you something. Outside the warehouse, beside a dumpster, Casey took out the glasses. These were in the goodie bag from the pizza place. Try them on. She held the glasses out to Jack. Jack put them on struck a cool pose, then laughed. Look in front of you, Casey said. Do you see her? See who? Jack said. The dancing ballerina. I don't see anybody, Jack said. They just make everything look blue, that's all. Let me see them, AJ said, taking the glasses from Jack and putting them on. He looked around. I don't see anything either. No ballerina? Casey said. It didn't make sense. Why could they not see her? Nope, everything just looks blue, like Jack said. AJ handed the glasses back to Casey. Casey was confused. Maybe the glasses only worked in front of Circus Baby's Pizza World. But that didn't make sense either. Why would someone make a toy that only worked in one place? She put on the glasses and looked straight in front of her across the street. The ballerina, Ballora, according to the instructions, was there, dancing in a garbage strewn alley between two warehouses. But soon the dizziness overcame her, and again, 
there was that uneasy feeling she'd had before. Well, I see her, Casey said, taking off the glasses before she lost her balance or threw up. Maybe there's something wrong with your eyes. Maybe there's something wrong with your brain, Jack said, laughing and elbowing AJ, who laughed too. Casey ignored his ribbing and put the glasses back in her jacket pocket. But she did wonder. Were they right? Was there something wrong with her? At the gas and go, they grabbed way more food than most people would buy in a convenience store. A jumbo loaf of bread, a jar of peanut butter, six bags of chips, cans of ravioli and beef stew, and a 12-pack of soda. Casey knew she would be the one to pay at the register because Jack and AJ always said she had an honest face. Also, people were less likely to suspect a woman of criminal activity. The cashier looked sleepy-eyed and bored as she rang up and bagged all the items. Casey scanned the stolen card in the machine and he held her breath. It took only a few seconds, but it felt like ages until the word approved appeared on the screen. Casey, Jack and AJ grabbed the bags and waited until they were outside the store to laugh at her good fortune. Well, we don't have to worry about food for a few days, Jack said. Hang on to that card, Casey. Casey put the card in a small compartment in her backpack. I will, but I don't know if we'll be able to use to get by. Yeah, I don't know if we'll be able to get by with using it again, she said. Usually credit card companies were pretty quick to cancel cards they expected were stolen. Back at the warehouse, they feasted on peanut butter sandwiches and potato chips and soda that was still cold from the convenience store's cooler. Jack and AJ were still high from the adrenaline rush of successfully using the stolen card. They laughed and joked around, but something was bothering Casey that she couldn't put her finger on. She smiled at Jack and AJ's jokes, but something that felt like worry was nagging her at the back of her brain. The weird thing was that while she felt it, she didn't really know what she was worried about. There was always the thief's worry of getting caught, the worry of being arrested, tried, jailed. That worry never went away, but this feeling was something else. Somehow it had to do with the glasses, the fact that she could see the dancing ballerina while Jack and AJ couldn't, with the strange way looking at the twirling ballerina made her feel. After they were finished eating, Casey grabbed one of the plastic bags from the convenience store. Put your trash in here, she said to Jack and AJ, and I'll take it out to the dumpster. Always cleaning up after everybody, such as a little housewife, Jack said, dropping his empty soda bottle in the bag. Hey, I can't help you. I can't help it if you guys are slobs, Casey said. I don't want to get a bug problem in here. Casey had grown up in a series of progressively dumpster apart dumpier apartments. Her mum would get evicted for not paying the, vent, the rent, and then they'd move to another place that was smaller and dirtier than the one before it. There were always cockroaches, and in the summer, an endless parade of ants. When Casey got old enough, she washed the dishes and took out the garbage that her mum let pile up. Cleaning helped some, but bugs would still come over from other people's apartments, like party ca crashes looking for free food and drink. Casey always thought that when she grew up, she would have a, um, a neat little apartment of her own that would be clean and bug-free. Unlike her mum, she would pay the rent on time every month. The warehouse wasn't exactly what she'd had in mind, but at least she could do her part to keep the bugs away. She took the trash bag outside and tossed it into the, dumper, uh, into the dumpster. Maybe she would take a walk. She felt a sudden need to be alone. She knew that, inside the warehouse, Jack and AJ would be making plans for the night. Since it was Friday, they'd probably want to go downtown to where the clubs were. If you waited late enough, uh, until people had been partying for hours, it was easy pickings. Casey could walk past a cluster of guys and lift three of their wallets without any of them noticing. Purses were always trickier because you couldn't grab them without the owner noticing. But Casey was fast. She had been in track and field before she dropped out of high school. There was no way a tipsy girl in heels could catch her. Usually Casey liked to plan out the evening's job with the guys. She liked to strategize how to come up with the biggest take possible, how to maximize their chances of success. It was like solving a puzzle. But right now she didn't feel like putting puzzle pieces together. She felt like walking, like clearing her head of the confusing thoughts swirling around inside it. Swirling. Swirling rhymed with twirling. Why, sh why couldn't she get that spinning ballerina doll out of her head? Okay. <laughs>
She walked to the park. Office workers on their lunch breaks sat on benches and ate sandwiches. A dog, a dog walker was somehow walking four dogs of different sizes without getting their leashes tangled. Casey smiled at the tiny Yorkie that was leading the pack as if it was the biggest dog of all. On the playground, little kids climbed and slid and swung, shouting and laughing. Their mums watched them, making sure they were safe. Casey en envied those kids. What it must be like, she wondered, to play with your heart's content and to know that whenever you got hungry or thirsty, your mum would just pull some crackers and a cold juice box out of a bag. To know that, when you were tired, you'd, you could go home and your mum would tuck you into your nice soft bed for a nap. Even as a little kid, Casey had never known that kind of security. She walked into the more wooded area of the park because she liked the shade and the solitude. The fall leaves, red, gold and orange, were drifting down from the branches of the trees. Leaves that had already fallen crunched under her feet. It was the strangest thing. She didn't want to see Ballora. She didn't like the way seeing Ballora made her feel. Yet she felt herself reaching for the cardboard glasses felt herself putting them on. She felt the familiar dizziness, steadied herself against the tree, and stared into the woods in front of her, where sunlight sparkled through the gaps in the branches. There was Ballora, pirouetting among the colourful full leaves. As she spun, the bright leaves were sucked into her vortex. They flew around her, at first gently, then faster, as though trapped in a whirlwind. For a few seconds, Casey admired the beauty, but then she thought, Wait, if Ballora is just a picture, a hologram, then how is she affecting the objects around her? It didn't make sense. Also, wasn't Ballora closer to Casey than she was yesterday? It seemed like she was. Oh, the image was clearer for one thing, not so fuzzy. She could see the joints in the doll-like figure's arms and, and legs. She could see the blue eyes and red lips on the white face. The painted face looked clown-like. But unlike most clowns, Ballora wasn't smiling. The empty blue eyes didn't blink, but somehow Casey felt they were staring back at her. Ballora was looking at Casey and didn't like what she saw. Suddenly Casey couldn't catch her breath. She doubled over, afraid she might pass out. Why was she freaking out over a stupid toy? She yanked off the glasses and shoved them back into her jacket pocket. She was being ridiculous and she had to stop it. If you wanted to survive, you had to keep a cool head at all times. She should go back to the warehouse and talk to the guys. She needed to know about the plans for tonight. After midnight, Casey, Jack and AJ hit the clubs. They didn't go into them, but skulked in the darkness outside. The guys had targeted a couple of different bars and Casey was waiting in the alley outside a dance club that was frequented by a lot of college kids their pockets and purses fat with their mummy and daddy's money. She spotted her target. The girl was wearing a short, light pink dress with impossibly high pink heels. Her designer purse, the same, the same shade of pink as the dress and shoes, hung from a skinny strap draped over her shoulder. Pink dress girl was talking loudly and giggling with her boyfriend. Casey had a tool for jobs like these, a pair of strong scissors that would cut through a leather purse strap like it was only made of paper. She took out the scissors and stepped into the crowd. She slipped in behind Pink Dress Girl and positioned the scissors to cut the strap. As she snipped, someone bumped into her from behind. She slipped and the point of the sharp scissors found flesh. Oh my gosh. When Casey grabbed the purse, she saw a shallow but bloody gash on the girl's arm. Ow! What happened? The girl yelled. Hey, my purse! <laughs> I like to think she has that voice. Casey ran. She ran until she was sure she had put enough distance between her and her victim, then slowed to a casual walk, tucking the pink evening bag inside her jacket. In her mind, Casey kept seeing the girl's arms slashed by the scissors, the red blood vivid against the girl's pale skin. Casey hadn't meant to hurt her. Sure, getting your purse snatched might scare you a little, might inconvenience you, but it didn't cause any physical harm. Casey had rubbed dozens, maybe even hundreds of people. But she had never harmed anyone physically until tonight. Spilling blood changed things. It was an accident, Casey thought. But was it really? The girl wouldn't have gotten cut if Casey hadn't been lunging at her with the scissors. Casey hadn't meant to cut her. 
but she couldn't exactly claim to be innocent. Casey beat the other guys back to the warehouse. She grabbed a flashlight and sat down on her sleeping bag to see what she'd scored. She opened the pink purse and dumped out its contents, a driver's license, a lipstick, and a single $20 bill which, according to Thieves' Den rules, would have to be split three ways. Casey put the items back into the purse and sighed. It hadn't been worth the effort or the bloodshed. She settled down in her sleeping bag, but it was a long time until she fell asleep. The next day, Casey and Jack and AJ walked downtown, casing possible places for a job. They walked past the park where Casey had seen Ballora. Casey glanced into a grove of trees and saw the leaves rise and swirl like they had around the dancing doll. She put on her glasses, and there Ballora was, closer than before. She was getting closer every day. If Casey could just get the guys to see the doll, she would feel a lot better. Casey took off the glasses and hurried to catch up to Jack and AJ. Wait, you guys, Casey said. She held it out the glasses. Put these on and look over there, right in the middle of those trees. Again, AJ said. Not me. I love you like a sister, Casey, but I'm done with this weirdness. Jack rolled his eyes but said, All right, give them here. He put them on and looked where Casey was pointing. Nothing. Nothing? Casey's heart sank. Zilk, zip, nada, <laughs> Jack said. The way I see it, there are two solutions to this problem. One is locking you up in a soft room, and the other is this. He dropped the glasses in a nearby trash can. There, problem solved, okay? Casey felt a wave of relief wash over her. Jack was right. No glasses, no problem. Okay. She even felt herself smiling a little. Thanks, Jack. You're welcome, Jack said. Now, you need to pull it together. The thieves' den need your quick wits and nimble fingers. No more freaking out over weird stuff. Casey nodded. She couldn't believe she had let herself fall apart because of a cheap toy. Quick wits and nimble fingers. You've got him, Casey said, waggling her fingers. Why don't we take the bus to the Walmart and see if we can get that lady's credit card to work? Excellent idea, Jack said. See, you're better already. The guys headed on toward the bus stop, but Casey had it hesitated. The glasses were what made her see Ballora. Being rid of them, she wouldn't see Ballora. But that didn't mean Ballora wouldn't be there. She could still be following Casey, getting closer to her every day, but Casey would have no idea of where, knowing where she was. The thought of an invisible Ballora was scarier than the thought of a visible one. Casey reached into the trash can, retrieved the glasses, and put them back in her pocket before she ran to the bus stop. At the big box store, Casey picked out a pair of new boots, heavy, comfortable and practical. They all grabbed packages of socks and underwear and shirts. Buying too much stuff would arouse suspicion, so they tried to limit themselves to the things they needed the most. As always, Casey was the one to make a purchase because of her honest face. Her face didn't matter much, though because the cashier rang up on items without looking at her, then she asked robotically, Debit, credit or cash? Credit. Casey said, holding out the st stolen card. The woman scanned the card in the machine, frowned, then tried again. I'm sorry ma'am, this card has been declined. Do you have another card you'd like to tr use today? No thank you. Casey grabbed the useless card, abandoned her attempted purchases, and walked quickly to the front door where Jack and AJ were waiting. Declined, she said. Well that sucks, Jack said as they walked out the door. AJ shook his head. The lady must have reported it stolen. Too bad. I was kind of looking forward to my new socks and undies. Only one thing to do, Casey said. She took out her big scissors, cut the card into tiny pieces, and scattered the confetti into the nearest trash can. On the way back to the warehouse, they passed the park. Casey heard the rustling of leaves and glanced over to see them swirling. That didn't mean Ballora was there, she told herself. She clenched her hands into her fist to stop herself from getting the glasses out of her pocket. The swirling leaves meant only that it was a windy day, that was all. Tonight's job had to make up for their run of bad luck. They sat huddled in the warehouse, eating canned ravioli with their hands and trying to figure out their next move. We could try that pizza place again, Jack said. People do take cash to those places. No, Casey's response was automatic and forceful. Why not, Jack said. Afraid you might end up with some scary possessed toy? It's not that, Casey said. She probably deserved the mockery. She had let the thing with glasses get out of control. I just don't like to get kids involved, okay? We've not done the train station in a while, AJ said. It's real quick to mix in with a crowd there and pick some real pockets. 
It might be a good way to get your confidence back, Casey. Yeah, let's do that, Casey said. That's what she needed, an easy job. They didn't even have to go inside the station, just wait until rush hour when a bunch of people came spilling out the station's exit, then slip into the crowd unseen. Casey eased her way into the mass of people, scoping for prosperous looking businessmen, with wallet shaped bulges in their back pockets. She just found one and was reaching for it when someone grabbed her arm. She was startled, then saw it was Jack. She mouthed the words, let's go. When she saw the flashing blue lights, she understood. A police car had pulled up to the curb. Casey and AJ and Jack walked with the crowd, nice and casual, like they had just gotten off the train themselves. Casey didn't breathe easy until the blue light was way behind them. Could this day have been any worse? Jack said once they were back in the warehouse. Bad luck comes in... Uh, bad luck always comes in threes, AJ said, holding up three fingers. So we've got two down and one to go. I don't believe in superstition, Jack said. Not black cats, not broken mirrors, none of it. It was chilly in the warehouse, warmer than inside, but still not warm. Casey decided to keep her jacket on. It was getting nippier at night, and her hands were cold. Soon she'd have to buy or steal some gloves. She shoved her hands in, the, in her jacket pockets for warmth. Those were the glasses. There were the glasses. Where was Ballora? Was Ballora about to catch her? Was that the third piece of bad luck? Her heart pounded in panic, and she ran past Jack and AJ out of the warehouse. Now the cold was the least of her worries. Outside, she put her head in, in her hands and paced back and forth. Finally, with a shaking hand, she reached into her pocket and took out the glasses. Because she couldn't help herself, she put them on. There, under the beam, under a beam from a streetlight only a few yards away, Ballora twirled. She was closer than she'd ever been before. Casey could see every joint in her body, each detail of her face, torso and tutu. She was beautiful and horrible at the same time and she was definitely getting closer. Casey tore the glasses off and shoved them back into her pocket. She sat on the cold, damp curb and tried to think. Each time she had seen Ballora, she had been a little closer. What was going to happen when Ballora got close enough to touch her? Could Ballora catch her? Kelsey felt like she was waiting for a punishment. She didn't know if it would be swift and sure or long and torturous. She didn't want to know. There had to be a way to escape, Casey thought. Ballora had appeared the first time outside Circus Baby's Pizza World, the scene where Casey had stolen the glasses. Since then, Ballora had stalked her throughout the city. Maybe, Casey thought, Ballora could only follow her in the city where the crime had occurred. Maybe if Kelsey could leave, go somewhere else, she, would leave, she could leave Ballora behind. It was worth a shot. Casey waited until Jack and AJ were asleep, then sle sneaked into the warehouse and quietly rolled up her sleeping bag, grabbing her backpack of belongings. She took her portion of the money from the thieves' den hiding place and left Jack and AJ the rest. She wouldn't steal from them. They had been like brothers to her, annoying sometimes but good to her in their own way. It was a long walk to the bus station. She looked at the list of departures. The next bus leaving was headed for Memphis at 6am. She guessed she was going to Memphis. She bought a ticket which cost half of all of her money then settled, settled on a bench to try to sleep for a couple of hours. She woke at 4.30, awake of someone, aware of someone near here. Someone near her. <laughs> Sorry. She clutched her backpack to protect her belongings from people like herself. I'm sorry, I didn't mean to wake you up. The voice belonged to an elderly lady with grey hair and, a, and skin a couple of shades darker than Casey's. She had on a butter yellow flowered dress and a matching hat. She looked like she was going to church. It's okay, Casey said. I need to wake up anyway. My bus leaves in an hour and a half. Where are you headed? The lady settled herself down next to Casey. For a second, Casey wondered if she should tell her, but the old woman's tone was so kind she didn't see the harm in it. Memphis, she said. Oh, that won't be too long a trip, the lady said. I'm going to Chicago to see my son and daughter, in-law and my grandbabies. It'll be a nice visit once I get there. But it's going to be a long bus ride. You got family in Memphis? No, Mum, Casey said. I'm just looking for a fresh start. It wasn't like she could tell the old lady she was running from a ballerina doll that possibly meant her harm. That would make the old lady move off the bench real fast. You got a job lined up? The old lady asked. No, but I'll find something, Casey said. I always do. Good for you, the lady said, patting Casey's arm. I like to see a young person with some gumption. 
she picked up a large, a big straw tote bag and started rummaging through it. You hungry, baby? I packed enough breakfast, lunch and dinner for an army. There's no way I'm paying for a bus station food. It's expensive, it tastes bad, and it's bad for you. Katie was hungry. She hadn't realised it until the lady mentioned food. I am a little, yeah, but you don't have to share if you don't. I've got plenty, baby. From the bag she produced a small bottle of orange juice, cold and wet with condensation. Then she handed Casey something wrapped in aluminum foil. <coughs> Ham biscuit, she said. You're not one of those young people who don't eat pork, are you? No, ma'am. I'll eat anything that's put in front of me, thank you. The biscuit was homemade and fluffy, and the ham was just the right amount of sweet and savoury. It was the best food Casey has eaten in a long time. Delicious, she said. I'm glad you like it, the old woman patted Ka Casey's arm one more time, and then rose stiffly from the bench. I'd better go to the ladies' room before I get on the bus. Those bathrooms on the bus are not fun. I like a bathroom that stays put. Casey laughed. Yes, ma'am. It was the nicest conversation she could remember having in a long time. The old lady looked at Casey for a long moment. Listen, I know it's not my place, but since I'm never going to see you again, I may as well say my piece. You seem like a young lady who's running away from something. In my experience, sometimes if you try and run away from your problems, those problems just end up following you. Does that make sense? Casey nodded. She couldn't look into the lady's eyes. It's better to build bridge bridges than to burn them honey. You remember that? The old lady tottered away, and Casey felt a chill at the prospect of her problems following her, of Ballora following her. She hoped with all of her heart that the young, the, oh my gosh, that the old lady was wrong. Casey stepped, oh my gosh, <laughs> sorry, you're probably getting annoyed with me messing up so much. I am. <laughs> Casey slept through most of the long bus ride, waking occasionally to look out the window at the passing landscape. This was the longest trip she had ever taken, so she might as well enjoy the scenery. The further she travelled, the more hopeful she felt a fresh start. That's what she told the old lady she was headed for, and maybe she really was. No more stealing, no more living in fear, no more being stalked by a creepy twirling ballerina doll. Casey walked out of the bus station and into the Memphis sunshine. The sign at, the, at a rundown aqua coloured motel called the Best Choice Inn advertised room for $29.99 per night. Casey seriously doubted it was the truly the best choice, but it was better than sleeping on the street, and she had 40 bucks in her pocket. She walked into the motel's dark office and handed a 10 and a 20 to a haggard woman in a housecoat and bedroom slippers. The room had decades old cheap panelling and once tan carpet stained by many years worth of careless guests, but there was a double bed and a cable TV and a bathroom that Casey could have had all to herself. The first step in her fresh start was a shower. Casey let the hot water pound her neck and her shoulders. She couldn't remember the last time she'd washed her hair, and she used the whole little bottle of motel-issued shampoo to lather up her braids and her scalp. She soaked herself from head to toe and let the jets of hot water rinse her clean. It was heaven. Casey always tried to keep up her hygiene, living on the streets, but there was no way baby wipes in a fast food restroom sink could compare to a real hot shower. After she dried off, Casey brushed her teeth and put on the cleanest clothes she had. It was time to find her a fresh start. Walking the streets of Memphis, she came across an old diner called the Royal Cafe, which had a hand-lettered sign in the window reading, Help Wanted. Oh God! <laughs> the cafe wasn't royal any more than the hotel. Than the motel she was staying was the best choice. But she had to be realistic. How long had it been since she had worked a real job? Not since the time at Famous Fried Chicken, where she'd stolen that twenty and started her life of crime. Inside the royal cafe, a bleached blonde waitress who could have been anywhere from thirty-five to sixty-five said, "Sit anywhere you want. I'm here about the job." Casey said. The waitress turned her head and yelled, Jimmy! <laughs> An olive-skinned man with tired eyes came out of the kitchen, drying his hands on a towel. His apron was stained with grease of various ages. Yeah? He said. She's here about the job, the waitress said. Her tone implied that she didn't think Casey was a very good candidate. You ever bust tables and wash dishes before? The man, presum presumably Jimmy, asked. Sure, Casey said. She hadn't, but how hard could it be? 
Them bus pans and dish trays can be pretty heavy. You think you can handle them? You're an itty bitty thing. I'm small, but I'm strong. He smiled a little. You got a name? Casey. When can you start, Casey? It wasn't a very demanding interview. She hadn't even told her her last name. Um, when do you need me? How about now? It wasn't like she had anything else to do. She might as well start earning money right now. Sure, but don't I need training or something? Jimmy looked at her like she had asked a stupid question. You get a bus pan. You clear the dishes from the tables and put them in the bus pan. You carry the dishes to the kitchen. Rinse them in hot water in the sink. Then load them in the dishwasher and turn it on. When the dishes are clean, you unload the dishwasher and stack the dishes on the shelves. You got that? Yes, sir. Good. That was your training. It's minimum wage, paid in cash at the end of the week. Seven till two, Monday through Friday, with one meal, with one free meal per shift. That okay with you? Yes, sir. The pay was low, but she'd be off work by two, and a free hot meal every day would help her out a lot. Good, he said. Get to work. The job wasn't so bad. Jimmy yelled a lot, but it was never anything personal. Casey was able to rent her room in the Best Choice Inn by the week. She got to take advantage of the laundry room, the shower, and the cable TV, and the one big meal a day at the diner went a long way toward keeping her fed. Plus, Jimmy was a good cook. He said he was too skinny. Oh, he said he, she was too skinny, and his blue plate specials of meatloaf and turkey um, and dressing were starting to put a little meat on her bones. The work was physically hard, but mindless enough that she could daydream about whatever she wanted. Her only problem at work was that Brenda, the waitress she'd met the first time she walked into the place, seemed to have taken a dislike to her. Is that your real name, Casey? Brenda asked her one day while Casey was bussing a table. Sure is. She didn't look up. She kept on loading dishes into the pan. I was just wondering, because you didn't even give Jimmy your last name. He may not have good sense, but I do. Is that a fact? Casey said, dumping silverware into the bus pan with a clatter. You seem shifty to me, Brenda said, looking at her with narrowed eyes, like you're hiding something. Everybody's hiding something, Casey said lightly, picking up the heavy tray, even if it's just their holy old underwear under the clothes. She carried the full bus pan back to the kitchen. There was no way Brenda could find out about Casey's past as a thief. Fortunately, there were no arrest records since she had never been caught. Still, Brenda made Casey felt like she was being watched, and it was a feeling Casey didn't like. One afternoon, when Casey was bussing tables, she spotted two five-dollar bills lying under the salt and pepper shakers. The two fives reminded her of that twenty-dollar bill she lifted so easily at Famous Fried Chicken. Her fingers felt itchy. Brenda had gone out back for a five-minute break, and Casey was sure she hadn't seen the money. In one swift motion, she palmed one five-dollar bill and left the other where it was. It wasn't really stealing, Casey decided. It was just splitting the, fifth, the tip 50-50 between the person who served the customer and the person who cleaned up after the customer. Cleaning up was harder too. Customers were messy. Splitting the tip was perfectly fair. Casey promised herself that she wouldn't make a habit of, of taking tip money. And she didn't. Not really. She only stole when Brenda was on break or looking away. And she never took the whole tip. If a customer left three dollars, Casey took one. If a customer left seven, Casey took two. It wasn't much, but it helped with the little things. Doing a load of laundry at the motel, buying snacks and soda to have when she watched TV. And besides, Brenda was always mean to her. Taking a bit from a tip was like getting paid extra for hazardous duty. Today, Casey felt unusually hungry when she walked to work. She ignored the full leaves that swirled near her and left the, her glasses in her jacket pocket. She willed herself not to think about Ballora, but to think about food instead. Usually she took her one free meal per shift at lunch, but today she thought she might order breakfast instead. The royal breakfast special, she decided. Three buttermilk pancakes, two eggs to order, bacon and home fries. She was running early this morning, so she would have time to eat before the first customers trickled in. When she walked into the restaurant, Jimmy and Brenda were sitting together in the booth like they were waiting for her. They did not look happy. Casey, I'm glad you got here early this morning. Jimmy said, gesturing for her to sit down across from them. We need to talk. In Casey's experience, when somebody said, we need to talk, the words that came after weren't going to be good. Nobody ever said, we need to talk, so how about a raise in this plate of warm cookies? 
With a sinking feeling, Casey sat down in the booth. Jimmy folded his hands in front of him. Brenda has told me that since you started working here, she's been getting a lot less money in tips. Do you know anything about that? The hunger in Casey's stomach was replaced by fear. Sorry. How am I supposed to know what Brenda makes in tips? She asked. Well, Jimmy said, customers leave their tips on the table and sometimes the money is still on the table when you bust it. So, I know you've been stealing tips off the table, Brenda interrupted. Her face was red with rage. Not all the money, but enough so you think I won't notice. But I do notice. I know my regular customers. I know what they order and I know how much they tip. Casey remembered the first rule of Thieves Den. If suspected or caught, deny, deny, deny. Look, Brenda, I know you didn't like me from the moment I walked in the door. And that's okay, you don't have to like me. But that doesn't mean you have the right to accuse me of things I don't know anything about. See? Brenda Jim elbowed Jimmy. Shifty. Like I said, aren't you going to fire her? Jimmy closed his eyes and massaged his temples like he had the worst headache. <laughs> he was quiet so long that Casey finally broke the silence and said, Am I being fired, Jimmy? Jimmy opened his eyes. You're not being fired. You're being watched. If there's anything to what Brenda says, cut it out, or you will be fired. Now get back to work. Yes, sir. Cut it out, Brenda said. That's it? Like I said, I'm watching her, Jimmy said. Then looked at the door. Here comes the early morning crowd. You'd better get to work too. On the way home, Casey walked past the grassy area where the autumn leaves rose and swirled in a circle. Fine, she said to herself, and put on the glasses. There was Ballora, spinning nearer than ever. Clearly, there was no getting away from her. Dizziness overcame Kelsey. Ke oh my god, I said Kelsey. Oh no! <laughs> I might have said Kel Kelsey before, not going to lie. The names are pretty similar. Uh, Disneyness overcame Casey. Why? She yelled. Why do you keep following me? Several people turned to look at her like she was crazy. Was she crazy? She didn't even know anymore. That night, Casey dreamed she was sitting in a red velvet seat in a beautiful theatre with a golden domed ceiling. The theatre was empty except for Casey. The lights went down, sending the room into darkness and orchestral music swelled. The lights came up on the stage and Ballora danced out on tiptoe. She danced to the left side of the stage and a huge purple and gold satin banner unrolled from the ceiling. It was printed in fancy letters with the word liar. Ballora put her hands to her cheeks as if startled, then lifted her arms for a long pirouette. She danced over to the right side of the stage where another large purple and gold banner unrolled. This one was printed with the word thief. Ballora put her hands to her cheeks again, then danced to the centre of the stage, spun, and looked directly at Kelsey. Oh my god, I said Kelsey again. <laughs> okay, I'm, yeah. She pointed at her, and one more banner unfurled itself centre stage. This one says you. Casey woke up gasping in a cold sweat. She got up, threw on some clothes, yanked open the dresser drawers, and stuck the rest of her clothes in her backpack along with a coffee can of cash she'd saved up from working at the Royal Cafe. She, didn't, she couldn't go back there. They were onto her. She threw a couple of bills on the nightstand to cover the rest of the rent, then walked towards the bus station. The fresh air calmed her a little. She shoved her hands in her pockets. These were the glasses. She decided to take one last look. This time, she was really leaving Ballora behind. With a shaking hand, she took them out and put them on. Ballora was dancing just a few feet away from her. Casey could see every hinge, every tiny flaw in the paint job. If she walked 20 steps, the two of them would be close enough to touch. Casey shuddered and took off the glasses. Okay, I get it, she thought. I didn't really make a fresh start. I stole and I lied about it. But if I can just get away, away from her, I really will start over. I'll be a model citizen. The next bus out of town was going to Nashville. Nashville, Kate, Casey thought. Why not? A new town, a new job, a new start. For real this time. Once she was settled on the bus, Casey sank into a dreamless sleep. The Music City Motel where Casey rented a room had the same cheap panelling and stained carpet as the motel in Memphis. But it cost five dollars more a night. Lying on the lumpy mattress, looking at the wantads in a newspaper, Casey told herself she needed to make a real life. 
She needed to live instead of just surviving. She needed a job that could give her some kind of future. She needed to make friends, save up some money, and get that little apartment she dreamed of as a kid. Maybe she could go back to school at night and get her diploma. And she could get a dog. She still wanted a dog. Scanning through the wanted scanning through the want ads, one quarter eye. No experience necessary. Opportunities for ad advancement. Answer incoming calls for a major retail company. Must be able to communicate well. Must be able to work in busy, fast-paced environment. Start at $12 per hour with raises based on merit. Open interviews Monday through Friday, 9 a.m. to 2 p.m. to 2 p.m. It sounded better than washing dishes, but Casey had nothing to wear to an interview for an office job. She had remembered a business communications class she'd taken in high school. The textbook had a whole chapter on how to dress and present yourself for a job interview. Ripped, faded jeans and old boots repaired with duct tape definitely weren't on the list of acceptable apparel. Casey got the coffee can from when she'd hidden in it in the dresser drawer. She dumped all her money out on the bed and counted it. $229.76. When she set aside what she needed to pay for the room and the few groceries she bought, that left her with $44.76. Surely she could buy something to wear at that. She set out on foot in search of a store. She figured the nice clothing stores wouldn't be on this side of town, with its cheap motels and pawn shops and bail bondsmen's offices. She didn't want to spend any of her meagre money on a bus ride to the mall. Besides, she wouldn't be able to afford anything in one of the nice stores anyway. After an hour of walking, her feet aching in her battered boots, she found a store called Unique Fashions. In the window, bald, white, faceless mannequins modelled colourful dresses. Surely a store in this neighbourhood wouldn't be too expensive. Casey opened the door and started a little <clears throat> and started a little when the bell chime when the bell chimed. I think that's supposed to say startled. Huh. Uh, she passed a, a floor length mirror and saw herself as she must look to other people. Her clothes old, baggy and ill fitting, her face tired be beyond her years. She didn't look like she belonged in this store with its bright lights and neat racks of dresses, tops and skirts. Maybe she should just go. Let me know if there's anything I can help you with, honey, the woman behind the counter said. She was around the age of Casey's mum, wearing a canary yellow dress with a bright scarf and perfectly applied makeup. Casey wondered if she would ever look so put together. Thank you, she said. Casey browsed through the racks of clothing, not sure what would be best for a job interview not even sure of what size she wore. Finally, she found a crimson dress splashed with cream-coloured flowers. She remembered that once a cute boy in high school had told her her red was her colour. She knew it would look good on her. The sales lady, who had been the cash register, appeared beside her as if by magic. Do you want to try that on, honey? Casey nodded. Trouble is, I've not worn a dress in so long, I don't even know what size I wear. The lady looked up her up and down. We are no bigger than a minute. I'll try a six, she smiled. It's been a long time since I was six, about three kids ago. I bet you don't have any of those yet, do you? No, ma'am, not yet. Casey held on to the dress and imagined and tried to imagine a future with a steady job, a comfortable place to live, maybe even a husband and kids. Could that kind of life ever be in the cards for someone like her? It was hard to even picture what it would be like. The fitting rooms are over there, the sales lady said. Just holler if you need anything. Thank you. Casey locked herself in one of the tiny rooms and slipped off her boots, jacket, jeans and t-shirt. She pulled the dress over her head and looked at herself in the mirror. The sales lady had been right. Casey was a size 6. The dress fit perfectly, not too loose and not too tight, and the crimson and cream print complemented her skin tone. She looked respectable, like a regular person going to a regular job interview. Except she, that she had forgotten one thing. Standing in front of the mirror, Casey looked at her bare feet, which certainly weren't acceptable in an office job, but neither was wearing battered taped up boots with her new nice, nice dress. She had forgotten she needed shoes, and shoes were expensive. Feeling discouraged, she took off the dress and put on her ratty old clothes. She carried the dress with her out of the fitting room. There was a small shoe section in the back of the store. She figured she might as well see how much a pair would cost. There were some decent looking ten flats in her size on sale, for twenty-one dollars and ninety-seven cents, 
but she couldn't afford the shoes and the dress too, even with the discounted price. Desperate, panicked, Casey looked around the store. There were no visible security cameras and the sales lady was busy helping another customer, an elderly lady trying on a pink suit jacket. This would be the last time, Casey promised herself. She was only doing it so she could get a job interview. She rolled up the dress as small as she could and stuffed it in her backpack. She took, she took a deep breath, grabbed the shoebox with her flats in it and headed to the cash register. When the, sa uh, when the sales lady came to check her out, she said, Decided not to get the dress? Just these today, Casey said, handing the sales lady a 20 and a 10. At least she was paying for the shoes and not stealing them too, Casey thought. Plus, they would have been difficult to fit in her bag. The sales lady gave Casey her change, bagged up the shoe, and handed it to her. Thank you, honey. I hope you come back and see us soon. When Casey approached the front door, a horrible buzzing sound filled the store. Casey's stomach knotted in fear. The dress must have been some type of anti-theft device on it that activated the alarm. Caught. She'd never been caught before. Wait just a second there, honey. The sales lady called. I must not have scanned those shoes right. Casey was about to make a run for it, but outside the front door of the store, hundreds of full leaves swelled up furiously like a mini tornado. Casey didn't have to put on the glasses to know that Laura was right, right in the centre of her tempest. Her heart pounded on her chest. Casey knew that if she bolted out the door, she'd run right into Ballora. She was trapped. One way or the other, she was caught. At least if she stayed in the store, she had some idea of what the consequences would be. If she surrendered herself to Ballora, she had no idea what would happen. She just kept imagining Ballora's long, sharp nails, her teeth. Oh my gosh. The buzzing alarm hurt her eyes, making it impossible to think straight. Is there a problem, Helen? Another well-dressed woman? Pro oh, is there a problem, Helen? Another well-dressed woman, probably the manager, had emerged from the back of the store. In seconds, the manager and the sales lady were beside Casey. Let me see your bag for just a second, um, the sales lady said. Casey handed her over, hoping they didn't notice how hard she was shaking. The sales lady showed the manager the receipt. See, she paid for a purchase. The manager was looking at Casey as if she could see every misdeed Casey had ever committed. I think we better check her backpack too. She turned to Casey. Miss, we need to open your backpack and let us look inside. If everything checks out, you'll be free to go with our apologies for the inconvenience. Casey glanced outside. The leaves were swirling closer and harder, smacking against the glass of the door. She swallowed hard. There was no choice. Casey opened her backpack. The crimson of the dress tucked inside it was as bright as blood. That's the dress she tried on, the sales lady said. She sounded like Casey's theft was a personal betrayal. The manager grabbed Casey's arm. Well, that's that. I don't have any choice but to call the police. Casey looked outside at the swirling leaves, then back at the stern faces of the two women. Her eyes filled with tears, which was strange because Casey couldn't remember the last time she had cried. But now she cried for all the things she had lost, for all the bad things she'd done, and all the good things she had never got to, n to experience. Please, Casey said, sobbing. Don't call the police. I, I need the dress and shoes for a job interview but I didn't have enough money for both of them. So you thought stealing the, the dress was a good solution to that problem? The manager was still holding Casey's arm. I knew it wasn't a good solution, Casey said through her tears. It was the only solution I could think of. I'm so sorry. Where were all of these tears coming from? It was like she was a human waterfall. I have a solution. A voice came from behind them. It was the elderly woman that sales lady had been helping earlier. Her hair was perfectly groomed, and she was dressed elegantly in a cream-coloured pantsuit. I'll buy the young lady the dress. Mrs. Templeton, we couldn't let you do that, the manager said. Of course you can, Mrs. Templeton said. I spent a lot of money at this store. I'm a good customer, and the customer is always right. She smiled at the manager and sales lady. Right? Right, the manager said, but she sounded reluctant. Good, Mrs. Templeton offered her purse and took out her wallet. Now there's no need to call the police and this young lady can get to a job interview. What if there isn't a job interview? The manager said. What if she's lying? Mrs. Tempton looked Casey up and down. Well, that's a risk I'm willing to take, but I think she's telling the truth. She has an honest face. She was just in a desperate situation and didn't use her best judgment. Thank you, Casey said, 
tears still flowing. I'll pay you back when I can. Nonsense, Mrs. Templeton waved off Casey's offer. You just help out somebody else when they need it. Casey walked out of the store through all the swirling leaves. As she made her way down the street, she was still crying and drawing concerned looks from passers-by. She couldn't explain it, but she felt like she was changing, like something hard inside her was softening and breaking up. She stopped at the park to rest for a few minutes. She was tired from all the walking, from all the stress and fear. She sat on a bench and her hand reached into her pocket for the glasses before she even knew what she was doing. Had she lost Ballora after the women at the store had made things right? No, she was right there. Ballora stood before her and twirled, just a little more than arm's length away. She seemed to stare at Casey with her blank blue eyes, and then she spun and spun, creating a breeze Casey could feel in her face. She was close enough to touch. Why? Casey yelled. Why can I not get rid of you? She shoved the glasses in her pocket and ran. She ran away from Ballora, even though in her heart she knew Ballora was right there with her. She ran to the Music City Motel and locked the door behind her, panting. The words of the old woman at the bus station came back to her suddenly. Sometimes, when you try to run away from your problems, those problems end up following you. Scratch, scratch. The sound was coming from the window. Casey pulled back the curtain and saw nothing. Then she put on the glasses. Ballora was pressed against the window. Her face, pretty at a distance, was terrifying up close, split down the middle, with a gaping red mouth and glowing eyes, eyes which Casey thought saw right into her soul. Ballora's long, blue-painted fingernail scraped against the glass with a horrible metallic screech. Casey backed away from the window. Okay, Ballora, Casey said. Please, please just let me get to this job interview first. Then I know what I have to do. Ballora said nothing, just watched her with glowing blue eyes. Casey sat down on the bed and dug around in her backpack until she found what she was looking for. The driver's license of the woman whose purse she had stolen outside of Circus Baby's Pizza World. Sarah Avery. That was the name on the driver's license. And here, where Casey was standing in her new crimson dress and tan flats, was Sarah Avery's address. It was a split-level suburban home, not too fancy, but much nicer than anywhere Casey had ever lived. It hadn't been easy getting here with no bus fare. But finally, Casey had met a long-haul truck driver who was headed this way and willing to let her ride along. Casey had slipped on the glasses once during the trip and had seen Ballora's face pressed against the passenger's side's window, still watching her. <laughs> As Casey stood on the walkway in front of the house, working up the courage to go and ring the doorbell, the full leaves swirled around her. She didn't put on the glasses, but she felt Ballora behind her, sharing the space in the eye of the tiny tornado. Ballora was close enough to touch, waiting for Casey to lose her nerve, oh my gosh. Casey took a deep breath, walked up to the door and rang the bell. The leaves blew past her with a giant whoosh, and Casey felt a sudden, unfamiliar sense of calm and peace. A small woman with brown hair opened the door. She was wearing track pants and a t-shirt from a 5k run for charity. Hello, she said, sounding a little puzzled. Hi, Casey's voice uh, qu quavered. <laughs> you don't know me, and this is really awkward. Uh, do you remember that time a couple of months ago when your purse got stolen outside of Circus Baby's Pizza World? Sure, it was terrible. Nobody forgets something like that. She knitted her brow and looked at Casey. Are you the police? She was f so far off track that Casey couldn't help but smile. No, actually, I'm the thief, the thief, the thief who stole back your, who stole your purse. Ex-thief, that is. The woman's jaw dropped. You? But you look so nice. Why did you come here? I came because I wanted to give you this. She pulled Sarah's wallet from her backpack. I'm sure you've replaced your license by now, but your old one is in there. There's twenty dollars in there too. My first instalment of paying back what I took from you. I have a job now. I start on Monday. I'll send you more money after I get my first paycheck. Sarah took the wallet. This is amazing. What made you decide to do this? Casey thought of Ballora spinning wildly. I guess somebody finally scared me into doing the right thing. I've changed, I mean, I'm still changing. And I wanted to say I'm sorry and I and ask if you can ever forgive me. Of course I can, Sarah said. So few people admit they've done wrong, it's refreshing to get a real apology. Consider yourself forgiven. 
As a matter of fact, I was just making some tea. Would you like to come in and have a cup with me? Me? Katie said, as though there was somebody else Sarah could be talking to. Aren't you afraid I'll rob your house or something? As a matter of fact, I'm not. Come in. Sarah held the door open, and Katie walked into the bright sunny house. A big brown dog greeted her, wagging its tail. In the kitchen, the little girl Casey remembered from that night was sitting at the table, colouring a picture with crayons. She looked first at Casey, then at her mum. Mummy, do we know this lady? She asked. No, sweetie, but we're, going to, we're getting to know her, Sarah said, pouring hot water in mugs for tea. Casey smiled. In some ways, she felt like she was just getting to know herself. I'm Casey, she said to the little girl. I'm Isabella, the little girl said. Her eyes was blue, <laughs> were big and blue, but they were bright and lively, not blank like below. I swear to God, it's a blue-eyed girl. <laughs> oh no. Isabella, I think I have something that belongs to you, Casey said. Isabella hopped down from her chair. What is it? Casey reached into her bag, pulled out the cardboard glasses, and held them out to Isabella. Isabella's wide blue eyes grew even wider. It's my Ballora glasses! It's my Ballora glasses that got stole, mummy! Sarah set two mugs of tea and one cup of juice on the table. Stolen, not stoled. But you're right. Tell Casey thank you for returning them. Thank you for returning my glasses, Casey! Isabella said, smiling up at her. Casey smiled back. You're welcome- oh, Sorry, I'm just laughing at my own accent for that girl's voice. Oh, for God's sake. Casey knew she didn't need them anymore, and besides, they always had really belonged to Isabella. Isabella put on the glasses and let out a gasp of surprise. There she is, Isabella said. The little girl stood still for a moment, glasses on, her mouth agape in wonder. And then she started to dance. What? That ended so abruptly. I was literally, I thought I was like, like, like near the end, but like a few more pages at least. I turned the page and it's the last page. It's only got a few words on it. Okay. Okay, now I'm really confused. What does that mean? And then she started to dance. I mean, physically, literally, it means she, she was actually dancing. <laughs> huh. So... Interesting. So did uh, Casey... I guess Casey got away from Ballora then. She just passed on the torch to another victim and... And then she got killed? I don't know. I don't know... I don't know what this implies. What does, and then she started to dance, imply? I hate that. I hate how that's the last line. Are you kidding me? Okay. Well, <laughs> um, well I've been doing these in, in video sessions. And this one is six minutes long because I thought the book would be way longer. I mean, the story would be like, way longer. Wow. Okay. Okay, That that's... That was an interesting story, to say the least. Um, not my favourite. Definitely not my favourite. I don't understand. <laughs> I'm, I'm just baffled. I'm, I'm just confused at this point in, in time. Perplexed. That's a good word. Perplexed. I'm very perplexed. I don't understand. girl stood still for a moment, glasses on, her mouth agape in wonder, and then she started to dance. What does this mean? I, I'm wondering what it means for the, for the FNAF games. Like, right now, I can't think of anything. I can't think of what this means. I'm so lost. As I, as I mentioned before, Isabella had, um, had blue eyes. But I mean, wait, who was it who had blue eyes? I'm really lost at this point in time. No, because I thought Elizabeth had blue eyes, but she has uh, she has green eyes. 
So we do know that that family isn't the Afton family, because I thought I thought it was at the start because she had an older brother, but I don't think it is. I don't know. Huh. Well, tell me guys what you think of this story down below. I I quite enjoyed it. It wasn't my favourite story, as I said. Mainly because there weren't many lore bits in it, I don't think. Unless I'm just missing something completely. But I think I think that's it for now. Um, next time, we will be reading Coming Home, which is the story I'm most excited about in, in this book. Coming Home. And yeah... <laughs>